Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to do another round of questions today. Of course, never take any man's word for what they say. Remember from Acts chapter 17 how they searched the scriptures daily to find out if what they were being told was true or not. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, first question, we have Michael. We don't know where Michael's from. What are spirit bodies made of? And that's just something I can't really answer with any certainty, but a great place you can read about it is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 40 through, verses 40 through 58. And it makes it very clear there how we have a flesh body and a spiritual body. And one thing it does say about them, about our spiritual body, is it is incorruptible means it does not decay. It does not get old. And uh, Michael did also, he mentioned a great verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, which says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. So, yes, we, we will completely have understanding of things like that when Jesus Christ returns. And what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52? You find out at the last trump, that would be the seventh, that's when Jesus Christ returns. That is when we are all changed into our spiritual bodies. So you know that if we're still in these flesh bodies, Jesus Christ has not returned. We don't know this person's name. The Canadian government, CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, put $186 in my bank account for climate action incentive payment. I had no control over it. It went automatically into my account. Climate is in God's control. That's definitely true. It's got to do with climate change, pollution, etc. Is it right to accept this? Do I accept these kind of payouts from the government? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with you accepting that money. And I went and I looked into this, and if I understood it right, which I'm pretty sure I do, is that in Canada, they put like an extra tax on gas and things that they say cause climate change. And so you're already paying that extra. So this is like you getting money back that you've already paid. So definitely don't feel bad for one second about accepting that money. And uh, like it says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, I do want to read this, that it says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So yes, of course, there's no such thing as global warming. You're absolutely right about that. But yeah, hey, if they want to give you that money, go ahead and take it. Like I said, if I understand it right, it's money you've already paid anyway. And it's not it's perfectly fine as long as you don't have to say that you accept some false doctrine or you don't have to say that you worship a false god or anything like that. And you know the Holy Spirit will guide you, of course, in any situation. But yeah, don't feel bad about taking that money one bit. Another person, we don't know this person's name. And this kind of even kind of is similar to that last question in a way, but this is a totally different person. I have a question concerning the five-month period and or the two-and-a-half-month period when Satan arrives. I have been collecting silver to barter with for when Satan arrives during the two-and-a-half-month period. But will we have to also barter for goods at the beginning of the five-month period, or will we be able to use the one-world money until Satan arrives? Well, I want to make something very, very clear. Satan is here the entire five months, but he has different roles. And that's made very clear. in what, So at the beginning of Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, it mentions the beast that has seven heads and ten horns. That's the beginning of the five-month period. 
And it tells you in Revelation chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, that beast with seven heads and ten horns is the one who arises out of the bottomless pit and will go into perdition. That is Satan himself. That beast also includes his one world system, but that beast is Satan himself. That's his political role. And then in the middle of the five months is, and this can be backed up from Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 is one place among others. In the middle of the five months, that's when the deadly wound happens. That's when the deadly wound is healed. And that's when it turns religious. That's when Satan will put forth the decree you have to worship him. But it's his system the whole five months. So no, you absolutely do not have anything to do with that money. You do not touch it because that's because Satan's going to make a, a league, a covenant. And I want to read about it in the word of God. We're going to go. We're going to read a few verses in Daniel chapter 11. But before that, I want to mention, first of all, Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, where it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. That Satan here, that whole hour, that whole five months. And when it says in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, that there's silence in heaven for half an hour, it's for that half an hour that it turns religious. It's for the final two and a half months that Satan puts forth the decree you have to worship him. But he's here that whole five months on that sea, on that throne, but he has different roles. He might not even look the same the second two and a half months that he did the first two and a half. But he's here the whole five months. Make no mistake about that. And you have nothing to do with that one world system money at the beginning of the five months or any other time. And I want to mention also that you don't ever want to forget those first three beasts of Daniel chapter 7. And also how in Mark chapter 13, verse 22, it says, False prophets and false Christs shall rise. doesn't just say one. And Satan has different roles. You cannot be deceived. And like I've said before, I'll say it again. I think that Satan wants God's elect to think that the first two and a half months is the false Christ. And then he wants you to think that the second two and a half months, he wants you to think that is the coming of the true Christ when that deadly wound is healed. And don't ever forget, Mark 13 says, if the time was not shortened, even God's elect would be deceived. So no, we got to be on guard that whole five months. That flood of lies and deception is coming. So I want to pick it up, Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to pick it up in verse 21. We're just going to read a few verses here. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, and it reads, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. See, this is at the beginning of the five months. It's not until verse 31 that, uh, verse 31, arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. That's the middle of the week that you read about in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It's not until the middle that it turns religious and he says you have to worship him. But here he's making this covenant. These flatteries are coming at the beginning of the five months. Verse 22. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him. And shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Satan will have that covenant at the beginning of the five months. And just like it says in Revelation chapter 9, that it, the tribulation is a five month period. And it's just like the flood of Noah was five months, Genesis chapter 7, the last verse, that flood of lies of Satan on earth will be five months. Verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So yeah, he makes that league, that covenant, that one world system with that one world system money. You have nothing to do with it. You don't touch that money. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. 
He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Unlike anything that's ever happened in the history of time. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. So no, you're not going to have a single thing to do with that prey and spoil and riches that he'll scatter about. Do not be deceived. Beware. Satan has the role of the dragon, of the beast, and the false prophet. That's all Satan, but different roles. Do not be deceived. No, this is another different person, but we don't know this person's name either. Does 1 Peter chapter 3 mean that Jesus ministered to spirits all the way back to Adam? And the answer is absolutely yes. And what this person is referring to is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. I want to read here 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. And it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now this is really what he's referring to, what I'm about to read. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God weighed in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, were in few that his eight souls were saved by water. And what this is speaking of, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, those three days his flesh body was in the tomb, he went to the spirits in prison, which means he went to the, other, the wrong side of the gulf that's written of in Luke chapter 16, which is where that certain rich man was. And he went, and then I want to read also what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And it says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. So that means people, flesh men can say whatever they want trying to judge other people, but you know from Matthew chapter 7, we don't judge anybody. God's the judge. But Jesus Christ went and he preached the gospel to, for all the people all throughout time who lived before Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross. Christ went and preached the gospel to them. To give the same opportunity to accept Christ as we have after Jesus Christ paid the price. And God is completely fair. And I want to mention one more verse. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. Which says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And that referred to people in a flesh body when they accept Christ. And also to those spirits in prison that Jesus Christ went and gave them that opportunity to accept the gospel. And I want to mention Ephesians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 where it says how Christ descended into the lowest parts of the earth. That was when he went to the spirits in prison. And um, I also want to mention Acts chapter 2, verse 27, where it says how, Christ, uh, he, how his soul, Christ's spirit, is not going to be left in hell, in Hades, where he went to preach to the spirits in prison. And that's this, that, this, that same Greek word that it says where the rich man is. It, it's translated in hell in the, in the Greek in, Re, in Luke chapter 16. But yes, that's where Christ went to the wrong side of the gulf. To give anyone an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. God is completely fair. Praise God for it. I think this person's name is Maya, and we don't know where she's from. I kind of had a discussion online. He responded to something I wrote about God's food laws. I didn't know he was a priest till after the discussion. And then you go into things that he was saying, and I'm not even going to say those things, because I don't even want to put those type of false thoughts in anybody's head but to make a long story short for everyone that's listening this guy was basically saying that the Bible is wrong and he's right and of course so he's a false prophet a hundred percent no question about it 
And then you continue. What I am really asking is about the perfect oblation he kept talking about, saying Christ taught it. What is it or what is he talking about? He's just making up stuff. Then you continue. His argument was all about killing animals to eat was the same thing as blood sacrifices and that the perfect oblation was just fruits and vegetables. And that's just about the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. This guy was trying to tell her that it's wrong to eat meat. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Leviticus chapter 11 tells you the foods that are clean and the foods that are unclean to eat. And I, want to, and I wonder if you asked him for scripture to document what he was saying. And honestly, I don't even know why you even cared one bit what this guy said. I mean, I don't know why you even gave it the time of day. Maybe you felt led to do so. But anyone that says the Bible's wrong, I mean, don't even care one thing about what they say at all. And you don't cast your pearls before swine, like it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. And um, I want to mention Romans chapter 14, verse 2, which says, and this Romans chapter 14, it's all teaching you that you don't just go judging every little thing other people do. And that includes what they eat. And Romans chapter 14, verse 2 says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? I mean, who is this guy to judge? He's not the judge. And, all. and what is the perfect, oh, the perfect sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And just as all the animal sacrifices, they were to have no blemish, Jesus Christ became the sacrifice once for all. As you see in Hebrews chapter 10, and it also says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through about 17, it says, Don't let anybody judge you in me or in drink or in respect of the holy day or in respect of a Sabbath day. Because all those things were a shadow of what was to come and Jesus Christ became all those things. And all the ordinances were nailed to the cross. Now, should you follow the health laws? Absolutely. I mean, because why? Because if you don't, you're going to get sick. So yes, of course, we are to follow the health laws. But you don't go judging people. If they don't follow the health laws, you don't go judging them for it. Because like, like it's written in the Gospels, it's not what enters into your body that defiles you. It what, it's what comes out of your body. It's, it's what you do. It's what you say. And if someone were to go trying to judge someone for what they eat, that's probably only going to turn them away. We got bigger fish to fry than that. And we got, so you don't go judging what people eat. And I also want to read one more verse, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, meaning the Holy Spirit. So once again, don't even worry yourself for one more second about anything that that guy said. I mean, don't even give that one second of your time. Because we only care what the Bible says. And I always say, don't take my word or anyone else's word if they can't prove it in the Bible. So just let your mind be free of that. Stephen from Texas. Romans chapter 5 verse 18 tells us that through Adam sin passed to all. Knowing there were other races, how did his sin pass to all that were not his descendants? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with who is his descendants. The point is that we're all flesh. And I want to mention, uh, first I'm going to read Romans chapter 5 verse 18 so everyone knows what it says. For, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, speaking of the sin in the garden, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And because our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, that one who had no sin, he paid the price on the cross to give us all the opportunity for eternal life. And I also want to read Romans 5, 13, which says, For until the law, sin was in the world, 
but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So yeah, th there, was, there was other people that were sinning, but God hadn't given any specific law yet. But God did give that specific law to Adam and Eve, and, and they broke it. But it doesn't matter who would have been there. when it, Anyone would have broke the, the law because we all sin. And I, I definitely don't think Stephen's mindset is like this, what I'm about to say. But it, bother, it really bothers me when there's some people that say, Oh, if it wouldn't have been for Adam and Eve, we wouldn't even be in this mess. No, don't be arrogant. Don't be ignorant. Because everybody in a flesh body sins except for Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is God. So yeah, it happened to be Adam and Eve who God gave that commandment to and they ended up breaking it. But no matter who would have been there, they would have broke one of God's commandments, one of his laws, because we all sin and we are all children of God. We're all in these flesh bodies. So certainly no one should ever have the mindset, oh, I can't stand Adam and Eve. It's all their fault. That's a ridiculous mindset to have. No matter who was there, they would have sinned against God's commandments because we all sin and it's only possible for salvation through that one who is perfect, through the blood that was shed on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One more question. Aurelia from Japan. Please explain Armageddon. And you can read about it in the seventh vial. And one thing that's very important that you connect Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. You connect that to Revelation chapter 15, verse 5 where it speaks of the, the temple of God being opened, and you find out that the time frame of the vials, all seven vials are poured out after the seventh trumpet. And it's, it's pretty much obvious when you read the vials anyway, but that's important to understanding what the vials are. And I want to go, I wanna, I'm gonna, we're going to read about Armageddon. We're going to read... The, we're going to read the 5th, 6th, and 7th vial, and it's not going to be a lot. We're, we're going to read maybe 10 verses here, but we're going to read about Armageddon. We're going to find out what, what saith the Lord and His Word. We're going to pick it up in the 5th vial. We're going to go Revelation chapter 16, verse 10, and it reads, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. That word see in the Greek is thronos, which means the throne. That same throne that you read about in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, where you find out right there that see is Satan's see, and he is the beast. Well, but when that fifth vial gets poured out, he's going to be moved off that see. Verse 11. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Once again, three different roles of Satan. Verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So this is after the seventh trumpet. Everyone's changed into a spiritual body, but we're going to document it even further here in a second, that Satan will still try to convince people that even when they see Jesus Christ returning on that white horse, Satan's going to be trying to convince people to fight against Jesus Christ. That's what Armageddon is, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. Once again, that connects you to Revelation 11. After the seventh trumpet, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. 
And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. There will be no more confusion at that time. Everyone will know who the true Christ is and who's the false. But for a minute, people are even going to still try to fight against Jesus Christ when he's returning. Verse 20, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's over a hundred pounds. Those hundred pound hailstones are going to fall. And men blast from God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. And I want to document, we're just going to read about three more verses. Revelation chapter 19 goes right along with what we were just saying. Revelation chapter 19 is the return of the true Christ. Let's pick it up in verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the devil, once again, Revelation chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. And I saw the beast and the armies of the earth, or in, in the kings of the earth and their armies, gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They see Jesus Christ returning, and they're still going to try to fight against him. That's what Armageddon is. That's 100 pound hailstones are going to fall. Verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Once again, both the devil, just different roles that he will play. And Revelation 13 is all about that. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. After that, Satan will never be able to disguise himself as Christ. He will never be able to disguise himself as a political role. He will never be able to use a one world system again. But he will be locked in the pit for that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. But then he's going to be released at the end of the thousand years. Won't be able to disguise himself as Christ. Won't be able to do any of that that he did during the five months. But everyone's going to know that he's Satan. But unfortunately, some people are still going to follow him. And then they will suffer the second death and their soul will perish. Verse 21 to complete. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat up on the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So that's what Armageddon is. They even try to fight against Jesus Christ. But those hundred pound hailstones are going to fall. Jesus Christ will bring justice with that sword. And you can read about the first advent in Revelation or in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And you can read about the second advent in, Reve in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. And as you would read earlier in Revelation chapter 19, he's coming with a rod of iron to set things right. And shortly after those hundred pound hailstones fall, Shortly after that, that is when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And that's when the thousand year teaching period of Revelation 20 will begin. And as you see in that chapter, those of you that stand against the false Christ, you will be priests and reign with Jesus Christ through the thousand year teaching period. That's your destiny. That's the honor that you will receive as one of God's elect. You stay in the Word and study to show yourself approved so you're ready to stand against the false one and so you can allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you and as is your destiny in Mark 13 as it is written. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your written Word. We thank you for these prophecies and for this place you've given us. We can teach your Word. And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana. 
by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.